All right, uh, we're back. Uh, our next speakers uh, are Chris Vaughn and Tony Horvatten. And, uh, they'll share the memories of uh, Blake and Carol with us. So thank you for having us. We're just going to dip a toe in the water of, of, of what was Blake Dancaro. Um, where he was such a you know, diverse guy, it's hard to, to do it all in 20 minutes. So let's just get started and tell you a little bit about him. Oops, is that the beginning? No. There we go. Like that, there we go. So I'm gonna talk about Blake as an astronomer to begin with. Um, he was an astronomer in every sense of the word. I mean, he was a modern day Da Vinci or Galileo, if you wanna think of it that way. He loved viewing celestial objects through a manual telescope or through a fancy go-through system. And, you know, he, sure, he appreciated the deep sky objects that we all love, the messy objects and things like that, but um, his true passion was double stars. And he really liked to look at double stars because he could do that when the stupid moon was around, which is something that he used to talk about a lot. Um, now, for Blake, it was really the physics and the mechanics of the double stars that appealed to him. I mean, he was a, as I said, a real scientist at heart. So in around 1991, he began logging his observations of doubles, challenging himself to log as many as he possibly could. And he trained himself and anybody who, who had some interest as well, he would, he, would, he would preach the gospel to them on how to measure their motions, their brightness, log their characteristics very, very precisely and accurately, and therefore submit his data for research. So he, he participated in that a great extent. Uh, he loved to, to split the struves, as you might say, you know, challenging himself to split the more difficult double stars, um, attempting with different uh, telescope and optic combinations and different sky conditions. So by the time he got to the end of his life and the point where he could no longer do it, he'd reached something like 1,850 double stars in the catalog, which is quite an achievement. Um, that work will live on because Blake uh, uh, honored us by um, creating the RASC double star observing program. And uh, Frank Dempsey and I have, have had the privilege of being among the first to, to do that program. And it's kind of fun to, to do those uh, programs while proud of Papa Blake kind of monitored our progress and, and uh, delivered our, our, our certificates and our pins. Now Blake was, a, as I said, an, a superb observer. He was a master of the techniques for planning and carrying out observing campaigns. Uh, especially he liked, uh, one of his favorite apps was Sky Tools. And if you knew Blake, you knew that he was always on about Sky Tools and how accurate it was to uh, replicate the view through your telescope with your optical train. Um, he, you know, he always made an effort though to share his expertise and advice. And um, he would set aside his plans for the night. I mean, if he, if he came across somebody that was struggling, needed help with their setup or where, you know, having difficulty finding an object or noting what to see, what to see or what to find about it. He'd set his stuff aside and he would devote the rest of his night to helping that person. And so there are countless stories of people who have reminiscence of Blake, you know, rescuing them, saving them, getting them started, getting them going. And, uh, you know, lots of us are better observers for knowing Blake. Now, in 2022, I think by then he was, he was already ill. I'm not sure the stage, um, the stage of it at that point, but he became the first astronomer in residence at the Killarney Provincial Park, which was an initiative of York University. And because of his talent, his super talent for organizing and documentation and everything, he was the perfect person to start it off because he got up there, he'd get everything organized, he was able to do outreach, he was able to do astrophotography and, and teaching the park guests about everything, but also, setting things up so that everybody that followed along behind him could su be successful in the role. Now, that's the nights that are clear. On the cloudy nights, he kept busy as well. He turned his attention to making the Rask Observer's Handbook the most effective and accurate volume that it could be. Always, you know, finding bugs and things like that and, and uh, making sure that the editors knew of little tweaks that needed to be repaired. Um, then he decided that he would like to teach rascals uh, how to use Stellarium, recognizing it was one of the most effective tools and accessible tools that we all have. I use it all the time as well. And so he created the Stellarium training course, and then later he began working on or delivering um, a backyard EOS training course as well. And what's great 
is that he produced a team of people that can carry the work forward and, and continue on. Uh, Blake took on the role of the observing chair of RAS National, which was allowing him, which allowed him to improve their process, um, improve the online resources. So if you go to the, uh, let's just look through some of the slides here. He was a maker as well. Here's, this, uh, here's some pictures of his um, proud moments at Killarney Provincial Park. That's the uh, supernova in M101 there on the left that uh, Andy mentioned. Here's his uh, life list of his double stars. You can see that row, row 959, and this is just half the alphabet, so that's, that's how many he had. Very meticulous records. And then here's the uh, link to the, or the page to the uh, RASC observing program. And the Stellarium as well. Now, Blake loved technology, so he was a big proponent of the robotic telescope at the Burke Gaffney uh, Robotic Observatory at St. Mary's University. He inspired lots of us to use that free service. He, he got, me in, got me to give it a try too. I was a bit intimidated at first, but he walked me through it and showed me how easy it was. And what's great is that he has, uh, I'll, I'll mention his uh, blog in a couple of minutes here, but he actually made an effort of taking images of all of the W stars that he was interested in and many deep sky objects and archived those in galleries on his website. And here you can see on the right-hand side of the screen a, a, just a little snapshot subset of some of Blake's photos taken with the Burke Gaffney uh, telescope. So he would, he would request the images and then he would process the, process the images and then uh, post them on his site. So Blake delivered countless presentations, both in person and online, on double stars, on DIY, on making things. He delivered the sky this month at lots of the RASC meetings and uh, much, much more. And what's funny is that YouTube constantly offers his, his barn door tracker video to me when I'm, when I'm on YouTube. So, um, so he did something right there. So um, finally, uh, just a, a final mention is that, you know, uh, in another gesture of his selflessness and his generosity of spirit, you know, Blake bequeathed his telescopes to the RAS Toronto Center so that others can follow in his footsteps. So I'm gonna switch it over to Tony here so you can talk about another dimension of Blake. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Um, so yes, my name is Tony Hervatten, and I'm uh, very proud to be able to stand here tonight and tell all a little bit about my experience of uh, Blake within the Toronto Centre. But uh, before I get into that, I would like to mention uh, just that the Fun Facts presentation that we all see between these presentations was in fact designed and built by Blake. And it's quite obvious when you look at the, the jargon and the language in it, that is very fun and uh, very informal, and that was Blake. So uh, enjoy that, that presentation when you see it. So, well, I'm gonna speak first now about my experience of Blake at the CAO. Um, and we're, <clears throat> Chris and I are going to switch off a little bit there as we go. So at the CAO, <clears throat> well, where to begin? Well, in my capacity as the maintenance team lead at CAO, um, you know, Blake was a model of what you could ask for in a volunteer, uh, in someone who would come forward and be able to offer their, their skills, their time and their talents. He was skilled in so many different valuable ways, just physically he was, uh, he was an IT, um, he was skilled in IT, he was a computer trainer, uh, he, in IT he was both able to deal with uh, land infrastructure as well as software, so he took care of all of that uh, business for us, and we have a rather large land on the site, so that was important. Um, <clears throat> he was an experienced builder in, con in uh, construction as well, and uh, <clears throat> he was savvy with uh, working in small engines as well. So, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, aside from all of that, he was prolific in writing SOPs and manuals, and that was something, you know, is always really one of those drudgery things, well, you know, committee needs to have manuals and what have you, but he just dove right in, and I'll show you a little bit, a few examples as we go as to what he was doing there. So, but at the site, <clears throat> um, in 2007 when he joined, he just dove right in and became a volunteer, and in lots of different uh, portfolios across the center. Um, <clears throat> but at the, at the car, he became uh, pretty well indispensable in honing all of our procedures, and documenting all manner of things and tightening up our protocols and record keeping. 
So at work parties, as you can see, he just dove in and just got down and dirty. No task was beneath uh, Blake, what needed to be done. And he was often seen on the job with his familiar yellow helmet and his, what he called his safety sandals. So, <clears throat> yes, quite. And anyway, so here's a couple more shots uh, to enjoy. Um, and uh, yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> Blake had a, a lot of uh, uh, facial expressions, and I particularly like the one of him riding the mower here, which is in part uh, disassemble as it's under repair. Um, uh, but he was, he was just such a joy to be around. He was very infectious. And uh, as, as a mentor and a motivator, he was very good at that. Um, we've undertaken a lot of major projects at the car with simply just volunteer help. And yes, that's Blake climbing on the roof of our garage as we're trying to put up the uh, Davis Weather Station sending unit. And uh, to the right, you've got a picture there of, uh, this is just the end of the, the we have to have a wheelchair accessibility ramp that goes up to our front deck uh, that we had a contractor build the infrastructure for, but then we did all the picketing and all of the, the board laying as, as a team. And this is the ceremonial laying of the last plank uh, in, the, in the deck there. And Blake was right in there um, to make these things happen. And we've, we've done a lot of uh, many heavy duty kind of projects in development of the site simply with our volunteer labor. And members like Blake and Jeff Brown, who we've mentioned before, were really kind of instrumental in sparking the fire and building community in our uh, volunteer members. So <clears throat> we mentioned a little bit about record keeping. Well, here's a good example. This is just the first page of a three page spreadsheet that he created that documents um, what different documents are, what they do, where they're kept, when they're updated, what have you, and it is letter perfect, I assure you. And he just dove into that. So the picture on the right is cool because it's a face I've often seen from him when he's diving into documentation. It reminds me of his favorite uh, answer when you ask him a question. It's RTFM, you know. So that, that was Blake. So here's another couple good examples. On the left um, is a CAO timeline that he drew in Visio, and believe it or not, it is very detailed. Even though he became a member in 2007, he went back in the records and journals and created this graphical timeline of when everything occurred since we got the site in December of 97, and he was that meticulous. And the, the uh, document on the right is just an excerpt from a maintenance log for um, I believe it is, in this case, it's the uh, generator. It's our standby generator, the Guardian Generac that we have. And as you can see, just the attention to detail was just amazing. And I, I doubt that we'll be able to continue that uh, at this point. <clears throat> so uh, at CAO, um, Blake also regaled in our outreach efforts. And I haven't put any pictures in this segment. I'll, I'll leave that up to Chris when he comes back to that as well. But he enjoyed many, many member social events that we had there, uh, such as uh, open house and awards picnics, our uh, public events that we did for the public there, and the group events that we held. Uh, he also, I believe, served at some of the scout camps that we had there. So there, there were many facets to what Blake was doing at our site. And I'm, I'm very glad that he reported on many of these activities at RAN member night presentations. And these, of course, are all archived now on our YouTube channel. So they're there for posterity for people to have a look and go back and have a look and uh, a little bit more on that later. But at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. Thanks, Tony. One of the things that neither Tony nor I um, included much of in this presentation tonight is all the accolades and awards that Blake got. So that, that could be another presentation of itself. You can see a, a one example of that here, though, um, in the upper right, where he was part of the, the essential team at the DDO that, that made it a success after we returned. So Blake had always uh, been a participant uh, since he was a member of the Toronto Center Family Nights and Speaker Nights at the DDO. In that period up to about 2016, he'd bring a lawn scope or he'd fill a volunteer role all the time 
Um, he would deliver talks at the member nights we held there. Um, in 2013, he organized, uh, you can see in the lower right, cor right uh, corner there, uh, a Telescopes for New Users workshop. It was, it was spectacular, it was amazing, and he was like a sergeant at arms, you know, directing every, all, the, all, the, all the participants, both the, um, the subject matter experts and the guests as well. And one of the unique things I remember is that he, he actually made stickers of every sort of telescope type and, and make and manufacture, and we would wear whatever sticker was relevant to the kind of telescope gear we were an expert in. So someone could look at our chest and say, oh, you know me, so I'll talk to you. It was really, really well organized. Um, at the, uh, some of the uh, Toronto Center awards banquets or awards barbecues that we held at DDO, I remember one time, at least on one occasion, that Blake happily researched the DDO and led everyone on a merry tour around the grounds, uh, just, just for the, both for the RASCs members, but as well for the, um, for the you know, spouses and other plus ones that came to the event. Now there was a pause at uh, DDO for a while, and when RAS Toronto Centre returned to the centre in uh, a few years, you know, basically in the early 20, early 2010s um, or 20s, Blake stepped right up and became one of the trainees of the big telescope. So we were short of people that could operate the telescope at that time. So Blake was one of the people that stepped up. Now, being such an accomplished astronomer, outreach expert, technical wizard. He became soon one of the, you know, a few really prime operators of the big telescope, which allowed us to, uh, to deliver dome tours, let him lead dome tours and operate that historical telescope. Um, he volunteered at the big DDO opening kickoff. I'll bring, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But he also served alcohol at the uh, Rocks Night with the Stars event. That's the, that's the slide on the right, on the left hand side there. So he had a, he had a server's license and he chipped right in, so everywhere, he was everywhere. So there's a couple of shots of Blake at the DDO. And that's, uh, that's Tony DeSantos. He was able to bring Tony into the dome uh, for a look around at one, at one point. So he also served as a subject matter expert when we did some live stream events from the DDO, including our Mars Madness stream. Um, and like anybody, any of us that have fixated on the stars you know, all our lives, Blake was super chuffed to use the giant 74-inch telescope. I mean, he delighted when he got to use it for outreach, and he would also spend some time taking some peeks at some of his favorite double stars through it. Um, and he and I would love to geek out about the technology of the day and, you know, the mysterious antique eyepiece that we were using for outreach and what was the focal length and what was the magnification and what field of view did it give us. So we would, he would simulate it in Stellarium or in Sky Tools and we would try to sort of sleuth around what was going on. And all of that was helpful because eventually um, Richmond Hill, you know, uh, went ahead and purchased a modern eyepiece to use for outreach at DDO and I made sure I consulted Blake when I was assisting Richmond Hill with selecting the, um, the eyepiece that we picked. Uh, putting on his documentation writer's hat though, Blake helped us compile a uh, lengthy manual for telescope operations at the DDO. So we left out no detail. He made sure that there was no detail left out, we, that he had photographs of everything. Uh, he even sketched the, little, the reticles on the setting circles so that we could explain what every little tick meant so that the operators that were learning to use the telescope would have everything that they needed to do. He also took it upon himself to build a replica 3D print model of the DDO scope, and what's, he had assistance in that from Ward Legro and Steve McKinney. And what's nice is that these files are still available, and if rascals want to print their own DDO replica, um, they can do that. We can get them, get them a copy of those files. The DDO committee sorely missed Blake when he moved away from town. He still managed to help us out, though. He actually uh, took the, the one of the, there's a 10-inch Dobsonian at the DDO, one of the outreach scopes we use there. He took it home, and he fixed it for us. And uh, my first clue that Blake was ill was I had made arrangements to go and pick up that telescope from him a couple of summers ago, and uh, that's when I, when I could see that, that something wasn't quite right. Um, he shared with me since then many times that he missed being at DDO and running the big scope, uh, but his last kind of fitting, his last visit to DDO was you know, not that long ago, before, before uh, the end, and that he got to take Greg Crinklaw who was the author of Sky Tools, his beloved Sky Tools so software, um, on a tour through the dome. So that was a, a great treat for him to do as well. 
So I'll pass over to Tony. All right. Thanks very much, Chris. So as you can see, the, the, the titles we've picked here are, are a little bit cheeky, I guess. But so in terms of thinking of Blake off the clock, that is, so not, not official duties for the Toronto Centre or the RASC, because he did uh, pull yeoman duty for both organizations. They are separate, uh, separate organizations with, with uh, different programs. Um, he really enjoyed the social aspect of meeting together with the friends he'd made at the Toronto Centre. So uh, the, both of these pictures are taken at the uh, annual Algonquin Adventure, which was run for many years by the Chapmans at the New Lake Campground in Algonquin Park. Uh, there was a bit of a hiatus, and, but now Toronto Centre has brought that back, um, the, uh, the, the September adventure. Uh, at this point here, I'll just give a little bit of context to what you're seeing. So the, the slide on the left, um, that happens to be at, uh, at the hour yurt at the time when we were there and uh, our son is cooking up some back bacon and uh, a, a number of other campers are quite fixated with the, the smells of the cooking bacon here and as is Blake um, who was very fond of the barbecue so uh, lots of good times to be had not necessarily in astronomy on the right uh, this is a birthday cake that Blake had because it was just around his birthday time and his friends had got together and prepared a birthday cake in advance for him. Um, <clears throat> also the uh, Algonquin Adventure on the left, here Blake is very proudly receiving his moose, which is the five-year award for attending five years uh, of, of the AAA. And on the right is a trip to the uh, Algonquin Radio Observatory, uh, which is in the northeastern end of Algonquin Park. And there were a couple years where uh, Toronto Centre members made a pilgrimage out to the ARO, which is still operating under private hands, or at least it was a couple of years ago. I'm not sure today anymore. Um, and these were very fun trips, uh, much like the social aspects that, that we ran in, uh, that, uh, that we encountered at the car and um, elsewhere. So Blake really enjoyed doing these as well. So this particular one, this was uh, a, a rather simple trip. This uh, was to e South Etobicoke. There was a predicted ISS transit across the full moon. And back in the day, that was something to be able to uh, go out, photograph it, uh, record it. And we had our intrepid group. We went out there at something like, I don't know, three in the morning or something crazy. It was freezing cold. And there's Blake with his portable set up there. He's all ready to, to video record it, and he did uh, get a video recording of it. Uh, I don't know the, the date, but I'm guessing it's around 2010, I'm guessing, maybe 2012, not sure. Um, so these, these kinds of things Blake saw as a great challenge. And it was, even though it was darn cold, it was a fantastic night, and we all uh, then uh, re repaired to the Tim Hortons for uh, warming up afterwards. <clears throat> so here we see Blake at the Neef show in, uh, in the U.S. And on the right, uh, this is the group of intrepid astronomers from Toronto Centre that went to Wyoming, uh, to Glendale, Wyoming, to view the total solar eclipse in August of 2017. And that was a fantastic trip. Um, you know, it probably, probably marks the high point on many uh, astro astronomical careers of the people who went there. So here, here again, now on the left we have a slide of the group that attended to the CAO to watch the transit of Venus. And does anyone remember the year? Is that 2013? Is that when that was? 2012, sorry? Anyway, um, and it, what's, what's interesting here is there's a group from Toronto but there also is a contingent from the Centre Francophone de Montréal. Uh, they actually drove all the way from Montreal to find clear skies, so they came to our uh, oasis uh, at the CAO, which, uh, interestingly enough, was quite cloudy when they arrived, and, and uh, they were quite concerned about having driven all that distance, but in the morning, it miraculously cleared the blue skies, and everyone was very pleased with that. So that's 2004. 2004, wow, okay, that's going back then <laughs> quite a bit. But it was a very comfortable venue. We had all of the equipment there. We had a very hospitable three-bedroom residence. So it was a great venue to be able to host 
the, those intrepid travelers from Quebec. And on the right, also at the CAO, uh, this is a, believe it or not, uh, in the wintertime you can get some good drifts of snow that uh, are suitable for cutting with a, a wood saw, and we actually built a real igloo that you could seat about six or seven people in. And this was February, and Blake is smiling away from the igloo that he helped create. And of course, some other uh, activities. We see some uh, fellow uh, rascals with Blake attending the ball game here. And that, with that, I will turn it back over to Chris. Thank you very much. So we really want to um, highlight the legacy of Blake's writing experience. You know, we all, lots of us have seen his presentations um, in person or online, but uh, not everybody may be aware that Blake had a blog called Lumpy Darkness. And uh, he was a fine writer. He started the blog, I think the first entry is in 1970, way back when, and, and it built from there. And it was kind of a running log of his astro life. And he sometimes penned a little update, little personal update, but sometimes it was a remark on a discovery or a space mission or the new handbook came or something like that. Um, but it could also be a long form analysis with some research project that he was doing uh, on a telescope or on a piece of software. So it's a real gem to uh, kind of dive in. And we're, um, I've asked, I'm trying to, you know, a number of us are trying to make an effort to make sure that this doesn't go away, that this website gets maintained in some way and, and, and continues on. I already mentioned the fact that there was uh, life lists posted there and galleries of photographs and all kinds of things. Um, he, uh, he wrote extensively on Lumpy Darkness about using um, a Stellarium to control a telescope mount. Um, even, he even asked the developers of Stellarium to make improvements that he noted were deficient in the software, which they did after his passing, unfortunately. The, the, real, the version that, where they kind of solved it came out um, in the last little while. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the life lists and, and galleries as well. So there's the, there's the website, blog.lumpydarkness.com. So if you make a, make a remark and dive in. And that's just a random page where he created uh, an almanac for June 2023. I mean, just prolific, just amazing material there. Um, as I mentioned, he was, a, and Tony and I mentioned as well, he was a prolific author of manuals, including the DDO manual, CAO documentation, the material at the RAS National uh, Observing Programs. And you can always count on that material being accurate and comprehensive. Um, at one point, a funny story, um, he, in his role as the observing chair of the of RAS National, um, he discovered that David Levy had been updating his deep sky gem list in the observer's handbook from time to time. And that's fine, except that that's an observing program that people are trying to complete, and it might take two or three years to complete the program. So it's kind of a moving target. So Blake said, uh, Thanks, Dave, but could we just lock it in? And uh, you know, maybe if you want to highlight some bonus objects, something like that, that'd be fine. But please, please freeze the list so that everybody can finish the certificate and get their, get their pins. Um, Blake wrote a long-standing regular column in the RAS journal called Binary Universe, as you can see there on the left. And uh, it's another amazing resource if you want to go back to the back issues and read up on all kinds of useful astronomy apps and uh, software that, that a lot of us, a lot of us can take advantage of. In recent years, uh, Blake joined the team at Sky News, um, being able to contribute. Now, I think Blake saw a niche for himself because he was uh, uh, passionate about do-it-yourself and making and things like that. So he, a lot of his contributions to Sky News were in that vein. So there were. Um, articles on, again, 3D printing and, um, and do-it-yourself rigs and things like that. He was in discussions with the magazine about starting a new series on showcasing Canadian manufacturers of equipment, people like Kendrick and, and Norm Fulham and people like that. Um, but sadly, both Blake and Sky News met their demise, you know, prematurely, which is sad. So with that, um, I think we'll wrap up and I just, you know, um, Tony and I were going back and forth a little bit on some of our thoughts about Blake, and I, I think Blake would get a kick out of the idea that he was a multi-dimensional being, right? So a lot of us dealt with Blake in different capacities and in different roles, 
And I think that uh, he, he'd have a kick out of the, that sort of moniker. It could be astronomy, it could be beer, it could be cars, it could be uh, science fiction or some form, form of technology, anything you want. I, I can't, we can't think of a better um, example of a perfect rascal than Blake. You know, he lived and breathed the mandate of Rask, spreading the joy of astronomy, mentoring people, helping them along. Uh, he set the bar high, but um, all we can do is sort of carry on from his example and, uh, and try to emulate uh, his, good, his good deeds. Um, I'll recommend that if you haven't already seen them, you know, after his passing was posted on the, on the Rask National and Toronto Centre Fora, that the posts were floods with memorials and remembrances and tributes to Blake. So it's actually a great, fun thing to read through and just have a chuckle now and again for some funny stories, but also just, you know, um, reflect on all the great experiences that we all had with them. So um, I think, Tony, you want to talk about next summer? Um, yeah. So I just wanted to mention, Chris and I had quite a bit of difficulty actually settling and deciding on what we wanted to say tonight because where do you draw the line? I mean, there's just so much, I mean, the awards that he got, you know, the, the three or four Toronto Centre Awards, he got the National Service Award. Um, but next summer in June, there's planned a celebration of life for Blake and that will likely be at the CAO at the request of the family. But uh, just keep watching the channels, um, the forum, and what have you for information on when that, <clears throat> that might be happening. And that would be a good time for, a good opportunity for everyone to participate and, and either share their experience of Blake uh, and to participate. And with that, uh, I guess we'll, we'll take any comments or questions then. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Tony and Chris, for taking the time to compile this list of memories, I suppose. Truly a remarkable individual and greatly missed. Um, any questions or comments, uh, more than questions perhaps, uh, thoughts, uh, memories of your own you want to share for a moment with us? Nothing in the room? Uh, online? We do have a bunch of uh, comments online and a question. Um, let me start with the comments first, if I may. So Pat Sellis wrote, Blake was an amazing resource, one of the best instructors I've come across. Uh, Louis Rifkin says, Blake was an amazing and always helpful and knowledgeable. Kim Hayes is asking, is there any way Blake's observing notes can be put online for observing? So that would be our first question. That's something we can, uh, we can investigate because we, uh, we're in com communication with this family and uh, all of that material has is, is been recovered anyway, so that we'll, we can look into that, sure. And I want to note that I just did a search on archive.org and I've noticed that Lumpy Darkness has been um, added to the archive.org and has been updated recently. Excellent. So at least that part of the website will be preserved. Excellent. Um, Eric Briggs writes, I am a big fan of timelines. I've got a pretty effective archive in finding aid to RASC history. Blake's skill at documentation is far more effective than mine. Pat Sellis, uh, I've already read that, I apologize. Eric then writes, I definitely would like to 3D print Blake's model of the DDL. I'd like to put it next to the Hubble and Webb Telescope 3D printed models that are on display at the RESC office. And uh, Eric then writes, the space station transiting the moon event Tony mentioned was on December 10th, 2011. Okay. It was a trip. Thank you. All right, and we'll see what we can do about getting the, that uh, 3D printed data somewhere accessible then. Yeah, I would think he put on Thingiverse or something like that. Sure. Um, I'll see if I can find it now. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Good. Thanks again.